Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm going to get right at it. We're reading and discussing the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by Secretary of the U.S. Navy, Richard Wigginton Thompson. And last time on the program, we talked about the, the papacy, rather Pope Pius IX, and his issuance of the Encyclical and Syllabus of Error of 1864, which damned our popular form of government, that is, a government of, by, and for the people, and insisted Pope Pius IX, Pio Nino, as he's called by Roman Catholics, Pio Nino insisted that the only legitimate government is a government of, by, and for God. Okay, well, you don't have a problem with that? Well, it only becomes a problem when Pio Nino stood up and said that he was the representative of God on earth and that no government in the world is legitimate unless he has divine right authority over that government. Okay. So this new attitude of the papacy expressed in the, the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 came right before the declaration of papal infallibility. I mean, after all, if Pio Nino was the replacement of the Son of God on earth, certainly he should demonstrate some divine capability or some uh, holier-than-thou power, some divine power, right? Well, simply by reaching into his magic bag of tricks, he pulled out what we now know today as papal infallibility. And we know, if we understand the Scriptures, the human heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? But Pio Nino somehow managed to transcend humanity and become a god on this earth simply by declaring himself infallible. And with the syllabus of error in one hand and papal infallibility in the other, he declared that the popular government of the United States, in so many words, he declared that that government is apostate, it is heretical, it is rebellion, it is a pestilential error on the earth, and it needs to come under the subjection, the total submission of the divine right king to rule the earth, the Pope of Rome. Now, all of this wasn't expressed in such queer terms in the encyclical and syllabus of error, but it became the responsibility of the Roman Catholic hierarchy of this country to read the syllabus of error, understand its inherent meaning, and then gingerly express those sentiments to the American Roman Catholics. And part of that effort was taken up by the official Roman Catholic publication at the time, one of the most authoritarian and highly respected Roman Catholic publications called The Catholic World. And it was in The Catholic World that the Roman Catholics of this country first learned that it was the responsibility of every Roman Catholic to obey the Pope over the state on pain of sin, that the Pope was their true king, and that the government of the United States was the Pope's servant. And, and, and the government and the people must obey the Pope as if he were God himself on the earth. Now, that's how it came down to the Americans, of the American Roman Catholics, what was the true meaning of this, the encyclical and syllabus of error coupled with the declaration of papal infallibility. 
the Pope was, as it were, God on earth. And that the government of the United States, which was fashioned under Protestant tendencies, was heretical and must be overthrown. And what we have right here established in the country is a shadow government. This is the beginning of a shadow government. On the one hand, we have a, a government of, by, and for the people, and living side by side in plain, broad daylight is another government that is of, by, and for the Pope, whom I call the biblical Antichrist, the biblical and historical Antichrist. Now, <clears throat> beginning uh, a paragraph or two back for continuity, speaking of this, this article in the Catholic world where it was stated that obedience must be given to the Pope, the representative of God on earth, on pain of sin, it says these are not loose and idle sayings, nor are they expressed by ignorant and irresponsible men. The Catholic world is edited with great ability and possesses very high literary merit. It is issued from the Catholic Publication House in New York, manifestly with Episcopal sanction. In other words, this magazine this newspaper, this periodical, this Roman Catholic magazine, the Catholic world, is backed by the Roman Catholic Church. It's an official Roman Catholic publication in this country. Now it says, and when such a publication, such as the Catholic world, with such high endorsement, solemnly and under all its responsibilities, announces it as a, the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church that disobedience to the orders of the Pope is sin against God. What should interest the American people more than to inquire whether it is contemplated or is even possible that any of these orders should be directed against or shall threaten the existence of any of the principles entered into the structure of their own government. R.W. Thompson is telling us what we need to look at is how does this decree by the Pope that failure to, to obey his orders is sin, how does that affect our government? Remembering that Roman Catholics, although they be a minority at this period of time in our country, what influence could these Roman Catholics have on our government, which the Pope has openly said is heretical, a pestilential error? We've got raising up within the country Americans who are not truly Americans. They're papists. They must obey the Pope. And if the Pope has a problem with our form of government, then certainly common sense dictates that Roman Catholics, if they're obedient to their Pope, are going to overthrow our government. That's exactly what has happened. Now it says, as the prosecution of this inquiry progresses, much will appear well calculated to startle those whose avocations lead them into other fields of thought and investigation. In other words, this is going to be a... a, a a study and an investigation that is broad in scope. And this book covers the scope of this investigation as to what do these Roman Catholics, what threat do they pose to our, our popular form of government in this country. Now, beginning where we left off yesterday, it says, In the light of the teachings thus far announced, and of the further fact that the Pope's infallibility is now almost universally recognized in the United States, either by open approval or silent acquiescence. Silent acquiescence. In other words, the Protestants aren't beating down the doors of Washington, D.C. and kicking the Papists out of the government. 
they just silently acquiesce. I mean, after all, we don't want to have a we don't want to have a controversy with Catholics. They're Christians too, aren't they? Aren't they? Silent acquiescence, just like we see today. He says in the light of the teachings thus far announced and of, further, of the further fact that the Pope's infallibility is almost universally recognized in the United States, either by open approval or silent acquiescence, there's no other logical conclusion than that the papal hierarchy in this country entertain the desire to make our government and laws conform to the laws of God as they shall be interpreted and announced by the Pope. They profess to have been appointed to this mission by Almighty God and stimulated by the zeal endured by this conviction, the honesty of which there is no occasion to impeach, are undoubtedly arming themselves for the work with all the weapons which can be drawn from the pontifical armory. The cat and the Catholic world, in order to in this publication, this Roman Catholic publication called the the Catholic World, in order to incite the courage of the assailants and bring about this result with all possible expedition, that is the overthrow of our popular government, declares in advance that all human laws must be resisted when they stand in the way of the grand achievement that all private interests must be sacrificed, that the most dreadful penalties must be incurred, and that the authority of the state must be braved. In other words, you have to stand up against the civil authorities, the state governments. Human affections must be disregarded Life must be sacrificed when loyalty to the truth and to the will of God, that is, the Pope, requires it. As the truth shall be declared and the will of God shall be announced by the infallible and unerring Pope. What this is, is a call to arms. It is a call to arms to Roman Catholics that their Lord God the Pope, their unerring, infallible representative of God on earth, has declared the government of the United States heretical in his encyclical and syllabus of error. He has dec decreed himself to be infallible in faith and morals, and he says, that obedience to his orders is required on pain of sin. And common sense dictates that if this representative of God on earth has a problem with the free, and I use the term liberally, Protestant form of government, then it is their duty to God and to his representative, the Pope, to overthrow that government and bring it into subjection and submission to the will of the Pope. I hope I've made this clear. This first chapter, which we've just concluded, forms the foundation for the, for the rest of the entirety of this book. And the rest of the book is dedicated to bringing up more understanding and more meaning to the tenets that were laid down in the first chapter. It's the foundation for the rest of this book. And I'm sure that if you'll be a regular listener during the reading and discussion of this book, you'll agree that this is one of the most important books ever written by an American author in this country. If you seek to understand why we are losing civil liberties in this country, why our government is becoming so oppressive, so intrusive into our private and personal lives, so controlling in what we read and what we hear and what we see in the media, 
so mind-controlling and how they have encroached even into our Protestant churches and to influence us to partake in this so-called ecumenical movement, then you'll understand all of it by reading and this book. I highly recommend that you not just listen to Inquisition Update, but that you get a copy of this book. It's getting hard to find. The Papacy and the Civil Power by Richard Wigginton Thompson, R.W. Thompson. Get it at any good Christian bookstore, history, uh, 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 a book, uh, uh, anti antique books, and that sort of thing. I got my copy on eBay. I just plugged the title into the search engine and added it to my favorite searches, and eBay searches the auctions for the title and will notify you when a copy of this book comes on uh, up for auction, and you can bid on it. I have two copies of this book, and uh, I don't loan them out unless I know I'm lending them to somebody who will certainly read them and then give them back. They're important. Now, we're going to begin Chapter 2 of this book, and in Chapter 2, we're going to be discussing the Pope and civil affairs, because that's what this is all about. We're talking about the temporal authority of the Pope over the government, okay? So we're going to be talking about the Pope and civil affairs, preparations to make him infallible. How did all that come about? The bishop's oath, this is very important, we need to understand what oath the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church take in submission to the papacy, and how they literally, through this oath, become ambassadors or agents of the papacy in direct antagonism to our, to our form of government. We're also going to be discussing the National Council of Baltimore. This is very important, too. And their theory, and their theory of government, talking about uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church hierarchy, what is their theory of government if it is opposed to our popular form of government? And we're going to talk about the defense of the ancient rights of the papacy. This is key. You have to understand what the ancient rights of the papacy were. The Pope has always declared himself the divine right ruler of the world, and therefore, by divine right, he has the right to, to appoint kings, to crown the kings of the earth that rule under his authority. And if they're disobedient, he has the right also to remove that crown from their heads. This is the ancient right of the papacy. It was established in 800 A.D. at the crowning of Charlemagne. It's a precedent that was set in 800 A.D. at the crowning of Charlemagne. When the pope crowned Charlemagne, he became his king. That is the ancient right of the papacy, which the Roman Catholics were committed to restore here in Protestant America. Now, we're going to, and also we're going to talk about the arraignment of Protestantism as infidelity and a failure. That's how Rome sees the Protestant Reformation. Infidelity and failure. Rebellion. Okay? Now we're, and then we're going to talk about popular and monarchical government that, that we're going to juxtapose our form of government based on Protestant principles and the monarchical form of government as established by the ancient papacy. Monarchy, top-down government. On the one hand, on our form of government, the people are at the top. In the papal form of government, the pope is at the top. The people are at the bottom. It's important that we understand the difference between popular and monarchical government. We're also going to talk about Protestant toleration necessary to popular government. All right, the author begins, chapter 2, page 40, if you're following along. It has come to be an axiom among all the advocates of free government 
that is our form of government, that, quote, error ceases to be dangerous when reason is left free to combat it, unquote. Let me read it again. Error ceases to be dangerous when reason is left free to combat it. All right, so let's ruminate on that a little bit. If reason is forbidden, then there's no way to combat error. It's important to understand that in our popular form of government, it is government of, by, and for the people. The people reason what is the best laws to govern our people, to maintain national sovereignty, to maintain the rights of the people, so that the people may live free and responsible lives. Reason is key to a free government, a popular government such as ours. But if a hierarchical, dictatorial, authoritarian, popish style of government replaces the people and dictates to the people, and the people have no recourse, no reason it comes into play, then error becomes dangerous. Okay, I hope I hope we've ruminated on that enough. Let's read it again. It's important. It says error ceases to be dangerous when reason is left free to combat it. A free society can combat error, but a dictatorial government that strips the people of their reason and dictates to them, they cannot resist error. Now, we have two systems spoken of here, a free system and a papal system. One can combat error because reason comes into play. The other is marked by error because it can't be questioned. That's the papal form of government. Now, the author continues, he says, but those who support the cause of imperialism, that is, the papal system, maintain the opposite of this, that the public mind and conscience are enlightened only in proportion as they are submissive to some superior governing power sufficiently strong to hold them in obedience. The contest between these two opposing theories is one between intelligence and ignorance. In the one case, society is recognized as being entitled to govern itself by laws of its own enacting, in other words, by reason, founded upon its own will. In the other, this right is entirely denied, and it is regarded as being fitted only for that condition of inferiority which shall reduce it to an unconsciousness of its own degradation. There you have juxtaposed on one hand the Protestant popular form of government and on the other the papal form of government. On the one hand we have our popular form of government which combats error by reason. A wise and prudent Christian American, a Protestant, would say, go get your brain and your Bible and let's sit down and reason. What thinkest thou? How shall we govern ourselves? Then, on the other hand, the second form of government, the shadow government, the papal system, says... Check your brain and your Bible at the door. Come in and sit down and listen, and we will govern you. Or rather, I, the Pope, will govern you. No need for your Bible, no need for your brain, no need for reason. You just leave the governing up to us. 
And by the way, <coughs> if you uh, don't obey, we'll burn you at the stake. Sound like I'm exaggerating, overstating? Just keep listening. It says, the contest between these two opposing theories is one between intelligence, and I'll add the word reason, and ignorance. Check your brain and your Bible at the door. You don't have to know anything. You can be completely ignorant. You just must obey. On the one hand, you have responsibility, as in the Protestant system, where you use your brain and your Bible to govern yourselves. And in the other, you have irresponsibility. You have no responsibility whatsoever. The Pope handles it all. The Pope and his Roman Catholic hierarchy. Now, in the one case, society is recognized as being entitled to govern itself by laws of its own enacting, founded upon its own will. In the other, this right is entirely denied, and it is regarded as being fitted only for that condition of inferiority which shall reduce it to an unconsciousness of its degradation. Now, the civil institutions of the United States are constructed upon the former of these theories. It's a Protestant government based on reason, based on responsibility, personal responsibility. And it says, wheresoever civil institutions have existed in obedience to the dictation of the papacy, on the other hand, they have been constructed upon the latter. Check your brain and your Bible at the door. We'll dictate to you, and you will obey. Now, Protestantism, with all its elevating tendencies, is the legitimate offspring of the one. Decrepitude, decay, and disruption have been the natural fruits of the other. Now, let me just emphasize, you can compare the Protestant form of government and our way of... I mean, after all, haven't we all heard, America is the greatest nation that ever existed on the planet. And you can compare the United States as it... <coughs> Not so much as it is today, but as it was early in the founding of this nation. You can compare it with any Roman Catholic country in the world, and there's a stark difference. The people are beaten down. They're ignorant. They don't have any education. They can barely feed themselves. They're serfs working the land that is owned by the Roman Catholic Church, and they give what little earnings they make to the church, and they bequeath all their belongings to the church to merit eternal life. Abject poverty. Sexual perversion. Total decrepitude. And then the United States, wealthy, affluent. The people are educated, industrious, churchgoers. But they hold Christ supreme. They enjoy the liberties of Christ, and they enjoy his blessings as well. The United States of America rose to prominence in the world because of Protestant principles the rest of the world suffers under the oppression, the ignorance of popery. Now, it says these considerations must be kept in mind in examining the claims now set up in behalf of the papacy in order that we may have a clear view of what we are required to surrender and under the character of the millennial... And, under, and, and understand the character of the millennial feast to which we are invited. Very, very curious statement that R.W. Thompson makes here. I wish he would have elaborated a little bit, but he kept it to himself. I can only imagine what millennial feast 
he is talking about here. I suggest that what R.W. Thompson is suggesting is that the Pope plans on a thousand years of ruling this world. I believe R.W. Thompson in that last phrase has outed himself as understanding that Christ is has prophesied his millennial rest. A thousand years Christ will rule on the earth. But the papacy sees that otherwise, that the papacy is going to rule. And we've been invited to participate in his millennial kingdom. But be that as it may, we'll continue. It says, when Pope Pius IX in 1867, remember, the Syllabus of Error was written in 1864, so we're talking only three years after the publication of the, the Syllabus of Error. It says, when Pope Pius IX in 1867 convened all the prelates of the Catholic world in Rome to witness the ceremony of the canonization of saints, to which their presence was not at all necessary, and assigned as one of the reasons for the convocation, quote, the extreme peril which threatens civil and, above all, sacred things, thoughtful men, as well Roman Catholic laymen as Protestants, wondered why so much expense should be incurred and so much labor performed for an object which could of itself confer no good upon Christianity or the church. Now, before I even continue, what, what, what do you suppose this great peril was that was threatening all civil and religious things? Republican forms of government. Popular forms of government. Governments springing up all over the world as a result of the Protestant Reformation where the people said, we don't need a pope anymore. We've got Christ. We don't need canon law anymore. We've got God's law. And we don't need a divine right king that's been crowned by the pope. We can elect our own king and form our own governments under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and our Bibles and our brains and reason. Such was the government of the United States of America. And that is the peril, the extreme peril, that threatened the civil and religious things of the papacy. Okay? So the Pope has to do something to combat this. If he's going to ever rule the world, he's got to stop the Protestant Reformation. And he's got to reestablish his old ancient rights in the world. Now, after this publication of the Syllabus of Error, the Pope had to get some feeling for how his syllabus was received by the Roman Catholic hierarchy around the world. So they conjured up this thing. They, they, they called all the prelates of the Roman Catholic Church to Rome to witness the canonization of saints. <laughs> like, that's a big deal, right? So R.W. Thompson figured out that <laughs> it's no big deal. What is the Pope really doing? Why is he calling all the Roman Catholic prelates around the world to show up to Rome for this phony canonization of, of, of saints? The real business of the papacy in convening this convocation was to assess what reaction the Roman Catholic hierarchy around the world had to the syllabus of error and to find out if they were going to go along with the Pope or not in declaring his papal infallibility and the damnation of popular governments and the proposition in the world of reestablishing the ancient rights of the papacy. So this convocation for the uh, the witnessing of the of the uh, the uh, the uh, canonization of saints is just a pretense it all has a, a more a more vital purpose for the papacy now it says thoughtful men as well Roman Catholic laymen as Protestants wondered why so much expense should be incurred and so much labor performed for an object 
that is, the canonization of saints, which could of itself confer no good upon Christianity or the Roman Catholic Church. And when these same Roman Catholic laymen had their attention then called, many of them, for the first time, to the now celebrated encyclical and syllabus of the Pope and saw their tendency to arrest the progress of the nations and turn them back toward the Middle Ages, many of the most intelligent of them did not hesitate to express their surprise. Some of them put one construction and some another upon the language of the Pope, while yet others, better informed of the motives of the papal action, attempted, by imperfect translations and false construction, to give it a meaning wholly at variance with what is now conceded on all hands to have been his actual design. But when the late Vatican Council enacted the decree which made papal infallibility for the first time a dogma of religious faith and threatened with anathema, all those who should refuse to recognize the Pope as incapable of all error in matters of faith and morals, all further disguise was thrown aside, and the world was awakened to the fact that these measures were but the inauguration of a deliberately concerted effort to make the papacy a power so absorbing and omnipotent that all nations and all peoples should be held by it in abject, passive, and humiliating subjugation. That's the real aim of the papacy. To put itself in a position that obliges every man, woman, and child, and government in, to hold them in abject, passive and humiliating subjection. Folks, that is the definition of the New World Order. R. W. Thompson, in 1876, already understood the New World Order. Now, he says, it would be an unjust reflection upon the acknowledged intelligence and sagacity of the papal hierarchy in this United States to suppose that they did not understand from the beginning the end the Pope had in view and the object he desired to accomplish. Their relations to him and their dependence upon him for their official positions and dignity require that there should be no concealment between them. The kind of obedience they pay him renders it necessary that they shall furnish him with the most undoubted assurance that they are always ready to execute whatever he shall command in the domain of faith and morals without stopping to inquire. Remember, check your brain and your Bible at the door without stopping to inquire, never mind reason, without stopping to inquire what human laws or institutions are in the way, except so far as it may be necessary to contrive some method to evade or overleap them. All this is required by the official oath taken by each of them. By it, their oath, they create an allegiance to the Pope considered higher and more binding than any earthly obligation. It obliges them to be, quote-unquote, faithful and obedient to him, to, quote, defend and keep the Roman papacy in the royalties of St. Peter, unquote, to do whatsoever they can to, quote-unquote, increase the papal privileges and authority, and to, quote, listen to this, persecute and oppose all heretics, schismatics, and rebels, which is just another word for Protestants, who shall stand in the way of making the rules of the Holy Fathers, the apostolic decrees, ordinances and disposals, reservations, provisions, and mandates, the foundation upon which all human institutions shall rest. 
That's a declaration of all-out war against anyone who would oppose universal papal supremacy. From the, a person's private life all the way up to the government of the nation and the states in which we live. It says, These American Roman Catholic prelates took the earliest occasion after the appearance of the syllabus to show not only that they fully comprehended its meaning, but that the Pope's reliance upon their fidelity to him was not misplaced. And this extraordinary document, is, it is asserted with dogmatic brevity and terseness, that it does not appertain, quote, to the civil power to define what are the rights and limits within which the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, may exercise authority, unquote, that its authority must be decided upon by itself, that is, by the Pope, and exercised, quote, without the permission and assent of the civil government, unquote, and that, quote, in the case of conflicting laws between the two powers, that is, the papacy and the civil power, the laws of the church must prevail over those of the state. Here, everything is plain. Nothing is equivocal. The subordination of the state to the Roman Catholic Church and the substitution of the papal hierarchy for the people in enacting and enforcing such laws as the Pope may think necessary for the Church, are distinctly and emphatically asserted. There's no room for misconstruction of the language, and it must be observed that the Pope is speaking alone of civil rights and limits, and the authority which the Church may exercise in reference to them, that is, over the class of temporalities holding the church to be in these respects above the state and having the right as its, as its superior, superior over the state, to command and to enforce obedience. That means the Roman Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic hierarchy, the papacy, can make the civil government obey. And the author continues, he says, it requires but a moderate share of intelligence. In other words, if you've got the brains of a burlap sack, you ought to be able to understand the implications of what was written in that syllabus. It says it requires a moderate share of intelligence to see that the principle here asserted is in direct antagonism to the theory of American government, and that, if established, it would violate one of the cherished provisions of the Constitution of the United States and of the Constitution of every state in the Union. The American hierarchy, the American Roman Catholic hierarchy, understand this perfectly well. Whosoever else may shelter themselves behind a plea of ignorance, they cannot. And yet this knowledge imposed no restraint whatever upon them in the expression of their submissiveness and obedience to the Pope. They considered themselves as owing their first and highest allegiance to him as the representative of the royalties of St. Peter and did not hesitate to avow it. Of all this, they have themselves furnished the most satisfactory evidence. These Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, much more so today than even in 1876 when this book was written, owe their first loyalty to the Pope as the representative of God on earth. And they are diametrically opposed to our popular form of government, our Protestant form of government. And no matter how friendly to our Republican form of government they seem to our faces, each and every one of them has sworn an oath to defend the papacy 
in this country. And how better to do that than to overthrow this heretical form of government and to install the papacy as the supreme governing authority. And that's exactly what's happening in this country today. Now, the Second National Council of the Roman Catholic Hierarchy in the United States met at Baltimore in October of 1866, only two years after the publication of Pope Pius IX's encyclical and Syllabus of Error. They got together in the first bishopric, archbishopric of this country, Baltimore, Maryland. It says nearly two years after the encyclical and syllabus was issued. It says it was composed of seven archbishops and 40 bishops, besides a number of superiors of religious orders, and was presided over by Archbishop Spalding of Baltimore as apostolic delegate representing the Pope, and thus giving to the assembly as much weight and influence within its jurisdiction as if the Pope had been personally present. That's what an apostolic delegate is. He represents the Pope, and whatever he says is said as if it came directly from the Pope, or as if the Pope was speaking. So the papacy thought this assembly of the bishops of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church who met in Baltimore was so important that he appointed an apostolic delegate to represent him at that meeting. And it says, in theory, it represented the great body of the Roman Catholic laity in the United States. But practically, it took no note of them or of their opinions. Remember, the Roman Catholic laity are just supposed to check their brains and their Bibles at the door and come in and be dictated to. Well, in a, when, when Roman Catholics live in a, in a government you know, in a nation that is ruled by a Protestant form of thinking, they must kowtow at least to some degree to the Protestants, otherwise they raise Protestant suspicion. So they put it together as though it were were to be attended by the Roman Catholic laity, when in fact it was nothing but the Roman Catholic hierarchy. And the people were shut out, just as they're shut out in every Roman Catholic go government. It was assembled, this gathering of the Roman Catholic hierarchy in Baltimore, it was assembled for a special work to respond to the, the encyclical and syllabus of error, and it did it to the great comfort and consolation of the Pope. In other words, they met, they un demonstrated that they understood his syllabus, they understood their oaths that they took to the Pope, and they assured the Pope through this council, they assured this representative of the Pope that they understood and they were going to go with the Pope. They understood that the Pope declared our form of government heretical, totally antithesis to the Roman Catholic system, and thereby they firmly established a shadow form of government in this country, a papal form of government designed to live and exist and work in this country steadily toward the overthrow of our Protestant form of government and, and to replace it with a papal form of government. It took place in Baltimore only two years after the publication of the, the encyclical and syllabus of error of Pope Pius IX in, 19, in 1864. And they've been working hard at overthrowing our government ever since. You can see it facts on the ground today. The rich ruling elite, the they, the them, the, the ones who are secretly controlling our government are hidden in plain sight. Every Roman Catholic bishop and archbishop, priest and laity in this country, helping the Pope overthrow our Protestant government. We'll talk about it next time on Inquisition Update.